So the time of flight mass spectrometer is just a race. I mean, nothing complicated here. All you got to do is supply some energy. So give a kick to these ions and they're going to start racing from one side to the other. The rule will be that the smallest ions will move faster because they have a constant kinetic energy. So one half mv squared, if the masses are different, the velocity has to compensate. So the smaller the ions, the faster they move. Simple, right? So actually there are a few more things we need to talk about. So let's take a look at the equations to start with. We've got one half mv squared, the kinetic energy of our ions. <clears throat> let's rearrange these equations so we can basically figure out a relationship between m over z and the flight time. So in the first one we have the velocity, which where I just said depends on the mass of charge by a square root term, and it also depends on the voltage that we use to accelerate. So when we look at the time here, we see that it just depends on distance over velocity. Distance is going to be constant, uh, unless, of course, the fact that, yeah, the flight tubes are made of metal, so they're going to expand and contract as a function of temperature. So, yeah, we have to control for that. But anyway, let's, let's say the distance is constant. So the time is just distance over velocity, which we've also calculated. So finally, we arrive at the mass of charge, which is proportional to the time that it takes to fly from one side to the other square term on that of course and if we can't say that the distance is a constant and the accelerating voltage is a constant then there is this direct relationship or in other words a time of flight instrument is a true mass analyzer it depends on mass to charge so i'm just curious now how fast are we talking about what is the flight time inside of a time of flight instrument well we have to throw in some numbers here now it's going to depend on mass obviously so let's just pick a mass 1000 uh, so, you know, pretty big molecule here, but by the way, we should be using the mass in kilograms. And for charge, we need to use this Coulombic charge as well, so we've got that conversion over there. So we can just plug those numbers into the equation, and I do need to pick an accelerating voltage, so 15 kilovolts is a, that's a high value, but that's kind of typical when it comes to time of flight instruments. So the question is, how fast is it? Well, I put some comparison out there. Is it as fast as a jet? Uh, yeah, it, it actually is. Um, how about how about a yeah the rocket ship flying out in outer space? Um, yeah, it's it's faster than that. All right, the Earth orbiting around the Sun. Actually, it's faster than that too. This is the best way to compare. How fast are we talking about? He's running around the world. Yeah, r r kind of that fast. Um, when we compare it to the speed of light, it's like 0.2% of the speed of light. So these ions are moving extremely quickly through the flight tube. That does beg the question though, if these ions are moving that quickly, it means that the difference in time between a big ion and one that's just slightly smaller than that must be extremely small. So you can do these types of calculations here as well and just compare the flight time and the difference in flight time. The time it takes for these ions in mass 721 is on the order of like 30 microseconds, but the gap between one atomic mass unit apart is in the nanosecond time range. So can we even detect those differences? Well, actually today with the computers that we've got to work with, these analog to digital con converters, they can do calculations on the order of 10 gigahertz. So well within these nanosecond time frames, and this is not even the fastest of the, of the computers that we use. I won't get into that, but it doesn't really matter because when it comes to a time of flight instrument, no matter how good we set things up, no matter how good our computers are to calculate these times, the resolution is actually still going to be terrible. So the yellow trace would kind of represent typical resolution in a, in a time of flight instrument, at least as I've just described right there. This picture over here is to the first time of flight 
uh, mass spectrum that was recorded, you know, 70 years ago now, um, I mean, we've gotten better, but it's still not very good of an instrument. So we're missing something here. There has to be a way to improve on the limitation. Let's ask the question, what's causing that limitation in the first place? And actually, we've already answered the question. So remember the fact that ions are not just stationary. They all have this initial energy distribution, the Boltzmann distribution. Some of them are flying that way, some of them are flying that way. So if we just kind of let that happen, these ions are inside of the ion source region and they've spread out. Now let me just clean this up just a little bit. Now we see that we have a cluster of ions on the close side of the, of the, uh, the voltage plate and then some on the back end. When we're talking about turning on the voltage, what we're doing is we're supplying that kinetic energy. The ions will accelerate through the entire source region from one side to the other. For the ions that are at the back end, they will feel the entire electric field. They will be accelerated the most. So the ions on the back end, as soon as we turn things on, they're going to accelerate and fly out with the full speed that they can. Now what about the ions way on the back end over there? Well they don't have much of an electric field to work with. Most of the voltage is already kind of canceled out, let's say. So these ions are not going to be accelerated with nearly the, the level that the other ions have. So they kind of kick out there a little bit slower. So the problem comes down to this. Even though the ions have the same mass to charge, they're going to be moving with different velocities. And for a time of flight instrument, that just doesn't work out at all. So the solution that is proposed is to build a different kind of time of flight instrument. And the best analogy is right here. So you know when you have those race tracks, the, the athletes that are running on the outside of the track, it looks like they have a head start, but that's because they have to go around a bigger loop. So they have to travel more distance. Right now you see that, well, it looks like somebody's in the front um, and they're traveling down the straight track, so everything's kind of even right now. But as they cur go around that curve, the people that are in the middle of the track are actually having that advantage. They don't need to go as far anymore. So in fact, they were actually ahead all along. So the instrument that I'm describing right now is called a reflectron time of flight. Now let me show you how it works. What we have is an ion mirror. So the ion mirror will be placed at the back end. The spot that it seemed like that's where the detector was, we don't even put it there technically. So our ions are going to start at the source region. They're going to move down towards the ion mirror and then they're going to bounce back. Now how do we do that? Well we have to apply a voltage that's kind of equal and opposite uh, so that the ions are going to kind of push back. And the ion mirror describes that as we go further down into the mirror the voltage is going to be a little bit higher just to kind of account for the fact that these ions might have a little bit more accelerating voltage to deal with. All right, let's just take a look. For an ion that has low initial energy, it's going to reflect back into the ion mirror and bounce back on itself. But if we compare that to an ion that has a little bit more energy, so let's say that it's a hotter ion, well, it's going to move down into the ion mirror. But if you notice, it actually moved a little bit deeper. So let's just put the two kind of side by side and compare that. We have the two ions and one of them had to move a little bit faster, but what you notice is that they actually hit the detector or the back end at the same time. So the configuration isn't exactly as you just saw. In fact, there's kind of a, a bend in the geometry here so that the ions don't come back and hit the same source region. You'd have to put the detector a little bit offset. So the path of, the, of these ions will be kind of on this, this trajectory of an angle like that. But you can see that the ions that have higher energy go further down into the mirror. They travel further, which kind of cancels out the fact that they were going faster. So this brings every ion of the same mass to charge back to the detector at the exact same time. And what you're looking at over here, these giant stainless steel tubes, they're about a meter, two meters in length, and uh, maybe like yay wide. So the ions are gonna be going down that tube and out the other end. So it, it gives enough room to place the source region and the detector at one end of, the, of this tube, and then the ion mirror will be placed like, let's say at the top end. So really when we're talking about a time of flight instrument, we're talking about a reflectron time of flight. But let me go back to the simpler example. So this is what we would call a linear time of flight instrument, which does have some use, but now I'm asking a different question. How do we start the race? All the ions do need to move from the beginning at the same starting point. And the problem we have is that if they're kind of 
spread out inside of that source region, well, the accelerating voltage will be entirely different. So one way to do that is just to basically paint or, or paste the ions down onto the surface plate itself. So in this case here, the ions are solids. And in fact, they're not even ions. So you see, I don't have a charge on those compounds yet. Imagine that they're solid compounds that are stuck to the surface of the metal plate. The voltage of that plate can be on because there's no ions, so they're not gonna move anywhere. So now the question is different. How do I charge those compounds? How do I ionize them very quickly so that we can start the race? And the answer to that usually is to, just, is to add a laser. So we'll talk about this in a later section, but if we have that laser, then we shine that down onto our compounds. As soon as that laser hits, we ionize the molecules, and since the voltage is always there, the race can begin. Now that is quite a convenient solution, but when it comes to analyzing compounds that are in a liquid phase, so in other words, LCMS, it doesn't really work out for us. So we do have to have a different configuration. The answer to that is to use what we call an orthogonal time of flight instrument. And this actually builds up a couple more instruments that we're gonna to have to talk about in the next section. So what you're looking at over here is actually a quadrupole time of flight instrument. The time of flight is now on the up down geometry. So the ions begin at the bottom, they're gonna travel up, uh, go through the ion mirror and then work their way down to the other side. But to make sure that all of the ions are focused in the same plane, we use quadrupoles. So the quadrupoles are making sure that the ions only have this velocity along this axis. They're not spreading out up and down. So they all have the same starting point with respect to the flight tube. And I should say more specifically that this is a Q, Q, TOF. In other words, there's at least two quadrupoles in that front end. So this closest analogy is to say that the front end of that is like the first two quadrupoles of a triple quadrupole system, but the back quadrupole is replaced with a time of flight instrument. So how does this thing compare to a triple quad? Well, it does all the work of a triple quad. It's got that tandem MS feature to it, but because we're dealing with a time of flight instrument, it has much higher resolution when we're dealing with the orthogonal uh, reflectron time of flight. We get the, the very high resolution uh, with the benefit of tandem MS. So this instrument, we call it a hybrid instrument, uh, combining the best of both worlds here. But of course, the quadrupole instrument is still a little bit of a mystery. We understand that it's designed to filter ions, but we'll have to talk about that a little bit more. That's in the next video.